Welcome back everybody, this is Simon from Insider Divers and in this video we're going to continue the underwater photography video tutorial series with Macro Part 2. Those who were following the Zoom webinars in 2020 will know that I didn't upload this. That's because I forget to press record in the Zoom webinar. Oops. <laughs> so anyway, I'm re-recording that now to complete the series and so you can enjoy this part as well. So let's dive right in. So this is part four of the underwater photography video tutorial series and macro part two. There were just quite a few extra topics that I wanted to cover, so we're putting them into this section. Um, just a couple words about myself. I'm German. I'm based in Hong Kong for 13 years already. I'm a scuba diver, free diver, everything uh, that is related to underwater is good for me. I'm a photographer, underwater photographer, uh, an author. I write lots of articles and I present at dive shows. Um, I'm also a photo coach, so I help people get better at their photography, both on my trips but also individually, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, via Zoom or uh, person to person. Um, I'm uh, sponsored by Isotta, um, Hollis, Bear and Atomic uh, amongst others which make it possible for me to um, pursue this career. The company uh, that uh, you are following on this YouTube channel is Insider Divers. We are a company that offers expert-led group trips. So you're being uh, put together in a group of like-minded people and you've got somebody like myself with you who's going to make it a very, very special itinerary. We know the area, we know the diving, we can help you with your photography and we make overall a much better experience. One thing that's really, really uh, important for us is education and coaching. In all of our trips, there's always some element of learning. You don't have to, but you you can. Uh, we will have talks uh, by, uh, by us or by um, scientists. We do citizen science projects. Uh, we do things to educate ourselves because we believe that you should never stop learning, which is why we call the oval um, part of uh, this YouTube channel that is just wisdom without being on site, Insider Academy rather than Insider Divers, because Insider Divers is when we're on site and Insider Academy is while we're at home looking at informative webinars. Um, so our YouTube channel is now really uh, loaded with lots of really, really cool content. So uh, if you want to learn anything about sharks, mantis, whales, you name it, uh, or photography, there's lots and lots of stuff. So check out the YouTube channel. So let's dive right into part four, macro part two. Uh, what we're going to cover today is uh, manual mode in a bit more detail because people were asking about that. Uh, we're going to talk about diopters. Uh, we're going to cover super wide aperture. Disco bokeh is another form of super wide aperture, as you'll see. And then we will cover slow shutter speed, which is a nice but very complicated little uh, tool that we can use in macro photography. So quite a few things. So let's get right to it. Um, first of all, I want to do a little reminder that you should always keep a shot list, okay? Keep the animals and the style of the photography on how you want to photograph them in a shot list. If you don't write it down, keep it in your head, but make sure that you have an idea on how you want to shoot something when you see it for the first time or when you see it the next time. So you'll be ready and won't have to start creative on the spot. So you can think about it at any time and get ready to shoot these photos. My list really hasn't changed much in 2020 for 2021 because in 2020 I didn't get to dive much outside of Hong Kong. So we still have some of the same photo photographs that we had last year. Just a reminder as well, this is my uh, sort of four piece uh, components for a perfect shot. You want to have a picture that's pleasing to the eye, so that's well framed, that has, you know, all the... Uh, principles of a pretty photo. Uh, there's a story in there, so you're telling some sort of story, you're explaining something to the viewer, keep keeping him captive. And if you're making it technically surprising by using some elements, some of which we will discuss today, then you can surprise him and all these three together make for a perfect picture, which is a killer shot, which might win you your first award. Uh, one person, uh, personal experience that I find very important is be ready. Don't just go diving until something happens. The lower you go in the water, make sure you've got the right light setting for that because if something swims by that's just a fleeting moment, you want to be ready to do that. So make sure you always do your test shots um, and have your camera and strobes ready to go. 
What else do we talk about? We talked about the different kinds of light, so ambient light and uh, subject lighting. Uh, we did that for black backgrounds. We explained how black backgrounds work. So basically your ambient light set by the camera is full pitch darkness and only the strobe lights up. So that's how you create black backgrounds. Today we'll talk about more about how to do that in detail for manual mode. We talked about surface lighting, keep that in mind that you always want to think about which area of the animal you want to light and direct your strobes at them. We talked about earmuffs lighting, which is very useful for black backgrounds and transparent animals or things with transparent bits like a hairy frogfish or um, nudibranchs or anything like that. We talked about various two-strobe setups like the forwards and backwards approach. We talked about the snoot, different ways and how you can use the snoot forwards and backwards backlight snooting as well. So all of that was in our last talk. We also talked about torch lighting. So what we want to cover today is about how to work with the diopter, and we need to understand manual mode for that. Uh, we're going to talk about high apertures. Uh, we're going to talk about disco bokeh. Yeah, you can see already where that's going. Uh, and slow shutter speed. That is something that we also want to cover today. So let's talk about manual mode. First of all, what is the difference between auto and manual mode? Well, lots of beginners start with auto mode because it's easy, right? The camera does everything for you. You don't have to think about anything. It pretty much, you just press the shutter and that's all you have to do. But the problem is the camera doesn't know what kind of effect you're going for. Particularly in macro, it's really hard to take a photo in auto mode if you want to achieve something because the camera doesn't know what you're trying to do and so it can't think along. It will just meter on the subject and take a photo. The other problem is the camera doesn't actually know you're underwater, so it can't adjust to the specific situations underwater, which is why everybody kind of uses uh, manual mode underwater. So don't be fooled by the sort of uh, underwater modes uh, in compact cameras. They're also essentially uh, auto modes, and you rather want to go into manual mode and set everything up yourself. So now that you are in manual mode, yeah, you have got a different situation. The human now decides on everything. The camera is dumb. The camera just follows the rules. Yeah? So you have all the options in the world that you can decide on and you can set them up as you like. Problem is, if you don't know what the options are, if you don't know what manual mode is, if you don't know the pitfalls, then you don't really know how to achieve what you would like to achieve. So let's talk about how it all works. So here's uh, some diagrams that I borrowed and adjusted a little bit for my liking. We've got three things that we need to talk about which is aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. All three influence your brightness of your picture, but also how sharp your picture looks in the front and background. So we're going to talk about all three levels, and then we're going to put them all together. Right? When we look at these effects, we have to talk about the primary effect of one of these three, or the lighting effect. So the primary effect is what is that uh, feature used for, and the lighting effect is a secondary effect that has an impact on the lighting. I think it will make more sense when I explain it in more detail. Yeah? Because all these three are interconnected. Because all three can increase the brightness of a picture and decrease the brightness of the picture, but have other effects on the side. So that's why they're all connected in what many people call the uh, holy trinity of underwater photography, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. I like to see it more like a pyramid because essentially I don't use them all three at the same time. I use them more often than others. And I'll explain you how to use these three. I call that the pyramid of light, trademark pending, <laughs> just kidding. But uh, pyramid of light is how I call it because I think you can stack them up and make your life easy and just be using one of them for most of the time. So let's talk first about aperture. The key in macro photography is getting just the right aperture. Yeah? Essentially, what you want to do is you want to get everything that's subject or a certain part of the subject, you want to get that sharp and the rest should be nice and creamy background. Right? So here, for example, we've got the eye detail of a mimic octopus and the sand in the background actually becomes sort of a Disco bokeh, what we're going to cut touch later. Yeah, so a blurry background that's kind of pretty because that's actually just sand, super boring. But if you shoot it in this way, uh, you can see the uh, um, the chromatophores from the uh, octopus really well, um, and you can see the background is quite creamy and nice. Yeah? Um, so therefore, you need to shoot with wide apertures. Mind you, this is SLR apertures um, um, and not 
compacts. With compacts, it's a bit different because the widest aperture is around 2 on a compact and the, the smallest aperture is around 11. So uh, for a DSLR, 7.1 is quite wide and you can see only the eyes are sharp on this ribbon needle. Yeah? Or here in the F13, also only the eyes are sharp, everything else is creamy. Right? So if you are shooting apertures, you have to think about what you're actually shooting. Yeah. So um, we've got different apertures and you have to look at your extreme per your camera. So like I said, compact start at 2, finish at sort of 11. So 2 is your widest, 11 is your smallest, 2 is your least sharp, 11 is your sharpest. Yeah. And on the wider the lens that you use, some of my lenses actually make it to f40, Yeah. you can go all the way to that extreme but essentially it will be very similar to what your F11 is on a compact. Yeah? So it very much depends on your lens and in your camera. So you can see that on the pictures, sorry, you can see that on the bottom of the lens, it tells you what the uh, lowest, uh, sort of the widest aperture is on your camera. Um, so let's talk about the primary effect of aperture. So to explain aperture, it's essentially the camera opening up to let light in and closing again. But how big that opening is determines how much of the picture is sharp, which is a physical sort of relationship that you cannot cheat. So if you've got a small aperture number, which is a wide aperture, yeah, then you only get one layer of your picture sharp, and the rest is not sharp, as you can see in this picture. If you're choosing a very small aperture, then you've got a... Uh, a small opening in your camera, but everything is sharp, front and back. And you would say, well, why won't I always do that? Well, that's because you don't always want to have everything sharp. So here is another diagram that I found online that shows a little bit on what you are uh, getting sharp. So here is um, not macro, but like long distance, but it's kind of similar um, to macro. Essentially, if you have that bear in the picture, if you're shooting it with a wide aperture, small number, then you only get the bear's face and immediate surrounding sharp. The rest in front and behind is is unfocused or in the bokeh. Yeah. Um, whereas if you shoot it with a small aperture, sort of small aperture, big number, then you uh, will get everything sharp in front of the bear and behind the bear. What that means is you don't always get everything sharp. Yeah. It's so you get everything sharp, but nothing really stands out. So uh, here it is explained with the different openings. So you can see that it's not super relative if you have a compact or a mirrorless, even an SLR, you will never actually see it, but that's where it originally came from. Yeah? So if the opening is small, then you've got a large number and that is very sharp. If you've got a wide aperture, then you've got a, uh, um, a big opening and very little of the picture is sharp. So that is now what you need to remember, yeah? but now let's talk about that secondary effect, the lighting effect. Yeah? So if you've got a wide aperture, you can imagine if you open something for a certain period of time, if you open it wider, you're going to have more light coming in. Right? Just imagine you would let sand run through your hand. If you open it for a little bit small, then only a little bit of sand will go up, but if you make a big hole, then all of the sand will go through. That means more light comes into the picture and that is an effect that we need to be aware of because it also will increase the brightness of our picture. Yeah? So the lighting effect on a wide aperture, small number, is a lot of light. And opposite on a high aperture, small, high aperture, small opening, high number, we've got very little light coming in. So that's something that we need to consider. So here uh, we have two pictures of a similar animal. One is shot with f20, same camera, uh, which is a Nikon uh, D7100 with a 60 millimeter macro. Uh, and then you've got an f10 on the other side. You can see that now we've got more focus on the eyes. Everything else is more creamy. So you can decide what's more interesting. The, le the left one is probably more informative. So if you're trying to tell a story, you want to explain, you want to make sure that people understand that these eggs belong to the mantis shrimp and that that mantis shrimp is holding those eggs together, then that is maybe your right choice. But if you want to make a detailed shot, like in this case of the eyes, and the eggs are something that are just a background, then you would shoot it with a wider aperture, smaller aperture number. 
So if you go super wide, here are two steps of super wide. You can see in the uh, left picture, it's an F10. Yeah? So with the F10, you can see that not much of this Murray is actually sharp. Only the nose bits are sharp. And on the right one, which is an F8, you can see it's even less with the F8. We only get the front end of these nose appendages that are sharp. So just to mention about bokeh, because that's what I already uh, used the word quite a bit without explaining it. Bokeh comes from Japanese and uh, literally means blur or haze. Um, and it is used widely in photography to explain that creamy background part. So the more bokeh you have, the creamier the background. Um, and the uh, less bokeh you have, the smaller, therefore, your aperture. Right? Um, so. If you want to use macro mode on a compact camera, yeah, there is a little button that you have to choose from and you can set it into macro mode. Right? Um, if you've got a TG5, you've got a limited macro mode. Unfortunately, the TG5 doesn't really have that much game. You only have about three apertures to choose from and the effect is not huge. But with the TG6, which this picture actually was taken, was not with the TG5 but with the TG6, you can still create amazing effects if you use a microscope mode. The microscope mode is kind of like a diopter, which we'll use a little bit, but you can see here that there is a lot of uh, bokeh uh, sort of in the picture, although they don't have much aperture game on this camera. So let's go right into diopters. So these are these lenses that many people use. And um, you can see here an extreme case where somebody stacked a whole lot of lenses on top of each other. In theory, they're all stackable and the effect gets more extreme, but that's really, really over the top. I don't think they could get any picture with this stacking. So let's talk about diopters. What do they actually do? Diopters are a very, very useful tool um, to reduce focus distance, particularly with system cameras the focus distance of a macro lens is quite far. So with a macro lens, you can bring in the focus distance, allowing to focus closer and therefore making the image larger. Um, but they also have magnet, uh, magnifying uh, properties and therefore magnifying the animal as well. You need to know that it also increases bokeh. So usually it will uh, necessitate to increase your aperture number, so make it smaller. So otherwise, it would just be way too creamy. And particularly if you're using a full frame camera, you will see that it's very hard to get anything sharp with a lens and a 105 or 100 millimeter lens. So on compacts, yeah, um, it's really helpful to create bokeh because compact cameras don't do much bokeh from the get-go. So therefore, using a, um, a, a, a macro adapter is very useful. Yeah, here's a picture from Iris from our last workshop, and uh, our last workshop is now a while ago. Um, but uh, this picture was on her first trial with uh, um, a macro. Sorry, with her first time with the camera on that trip and she already was experimenting with the diopter and she got like a very good macro detail picture with using that diopter. So what does the diopter do? This is maybe a bit more technical looking, but essentially what it does is by adding this lens in front of um, the, um, the camera, what you're doing is you're reducing the focal point. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So here, uh, now it's, you can see it in the slide, here we put the lens and with the lens what we do is we reduce the depth of field further, yeah, but we're also bringing the animal closer. So here, and this is maybe a bit better um, uh, visualization or simpler, if you've got a minimum focus distance that you can focus on, which in many camera system cameras it's about this distance, if you put a lens in between, you can now break the light to a way that you can focus much, much closer. The animal is now closer, therefore it's bigger proportionally in your picture. But then it looks like as if it was a much larger animal or the lens has a much bigger magnification. But actually it's just closer. So what you need to understand is a plus five is only there to reduce focus distance. Yeah? So many people get like a, a compact camera and then get a plus five. That's kind of ridiculous because a compact camera in macro mode can focus already very close. And at plus five, you almost have no magnification. Therefore, the one lens that you would want to get is uh, the plus 10 or something around plus 10. There's plus 12s. Uh, uh, lots of ones around this area, but don't get the thinnest ones because the thinnest ones are actually not doing much for you. They're only useful for 
big macro lenses like a 100 or a 105 where they just reduce the focus distance and let you use this camera uh, this lens actually in a useful setting uh, plus 15 and plus 20 and plus 25 etc are all with more magnification but they also come with a further reduction of the uh, focus distance so for example if you have a plus 25 you literally can focus about one finger width away from the lens which is quite hard to actually do in practice so when you use a diopter, you need to then be ready to get very close. Once you've put it on, it will only focus, like a plus 10 will usually focus around 10 centimeters, 8 to 12, something like that, maybe 5 depending on the brand, but this is something that you need to keep in mind. So it is very useful to have a flip adapter like the person here in the picture, because that allows you to first take a picture without the flip adapter from further away, make sure you've got your lighting right, know that you're, what you're doing with your subject, see that your subjects are moving, position yourself right, then flip on the adapter and get in closer. So the diopter position is basically an extension of your lens. So you want to put it, you put it in front of your um, um, dome port or um, a macro port, and then you are getting much closer to the animal. Now you want to adjust the strobes a bit differently, assuming that all the light comes in through the, your diopter. You arrange the strobes as if that was the end of your port. So in your original setting, you would have been aligning it with the port. Now you're aligning them with the diopter. Yeah? And you're still trying to use fringe lighting to light the subject. So don't gun right at it, but just using the outside of your strobe lighting um, for that matter. I've explained all this in part two and in part three. So make sure you have a look at these uh, because that's where I explain how strobe light works in more detail. So when you are you know, using a macro lens, you want to make sure that you're not ruining everything around you. So I've adopted this technique, which is my single finger tripod. I use my small finger uh, on the ground uh, or somewhere where there's dead coral or something. And then my camera rests on my thumb and this is my tripod. This is how I get my stability without touching the bottom. And that allows me to also get closer to things, um, which is, is much better than using a metal stick, which you uh, destroy the reef with and you're actually not that stable. So let's talk a bit about the aperture. So this, for example, is shot with f25, but with a 105 lens. It's a very small uh, uh, pygmy seahorse. Um, and uh, you can see that even though I'm shooting at f25, the background is really creamy. That is because I am using a big macro lens and probably a plus 10 or plus 15, I'm not quite sure. And so then the background is already creamy. Yeah, And so that means you can never really shoot any picture at aperture seven or something with that setup because nothing will ever be sharp. Right? So if you want to take something like this, this is also with a 105 and a 15, I think. Um, that's a hairy shrimp. You know how big they are, two, well, two millimeters, three millimeters max. Yeah, Then you need to make sure that you're actually getting detail. You can see here, classic situation, even though I'm using a a higher aperture, the eye is not sharp, even though the eye is only maybe half a millimeter closer to the camera, it's not sharp anymore. So you see here the problem is that once you look at the eye, that eye is not sharp. So once you take start taking those pictures, make sure that you um, actually look them up on your viewer on your camera and zoom in and make sure what is key is actually sharp, because otherwise, you know, the picture is sort of nice, but not really usable. So these are a couple of reminders. With a diopter, you want to use a high aperture, otherwise you can get a bit uh, too much bokeh and too little focus. Um, make sure you shoot it with a stable hand, check that your uh, details are sharp, and take many, many, many photos, okay? The problem is very often that you take only three photos and then you come back and you realize they're all out of focus or the bokeh is not right or whatever. Make sure that you take a lot of photos if you've got a good subject. Try different apertures out, make sure that you've got everything set up. And also, even though it's macro, make sure you still frame it right. Because if you zoomed in really, really close, but then you kind of misalign things, then it might not become a very good picture. This is uh, another pointer. So if you're just starting out, start with the 60 millimeter. The 60 millimeter is the go-to lens, it's what I use 90% of the time. Uh, a big one, like the 105, is gonna be much, much harder work. It's very difficult to shoot at lower f-stops, and it's really hard to control your sharpness. So I would say that's only a secondary um, uh, choice. I wouldn't start with that. I would start with a 60 or a 50 millimeter, depending on what camera you have. 
So for compacts, make sure you shoot in wide apertures and add the micro mode so that there it's automatically added. But for system cameras, you need to kind of keep yourself below, uh, sorry, above uh, f13. Um, and then the bigger the lens, the less you've got your depth of field. So now we're going to talk about super wide aperture, kind of connected to that previous topic. Right? But that's essentially when we create an extra blurry background. So where we only have the subject right and the background is nice and blurry. That's where we actually make a choice where we pick a subject, but we also pick a background where we want to make sure the background looks good as a pattern. Yeah? So here we've got like only the front details with 6.1 aperture. Um, and you can see only the teeth are sharp on this and the hair and the background kind of blend into one creaminess uh, is one style of photography. Yeah? You have to be careful not to do too much. Yeah, I did the same and you can see this was with a 105. The last picture was with a 60, it was still acceptable, but on the 105 you can see there's not even the whole frame of the mouth is sharp. So you really need to be careful how much you do it when you do the super apertures. Right? Also here you can see the, uh, the eye, um, the irises are just sharp, which is what I wanted to go for, and the rest is all not sharp. But you gotta be really careful that you actually get it, because when that's then also not sharp, you can throw the picture away. So how to set up for a bokeh shot? Well, essentially you set your ISO low, then you put your aperture low to the degree where you think it's possible, and then you use your shutter speed to fine tune your lighting. So that's why I put the pyramid that I explained in section two uh, in a different order. I do ISO, then aperture, and then shutter speed. And shutter speed is just there to sort of adjust my brightness. But generally, if I don't need it for brightness, I wanna keep it in a fast level because if you make it slow and then you're shaking it with your hand, then it will be less sharp, right? So if you've done all this, you've got a wide aperture, essentially that means you've got a lot, lot of light coming in, so you need to be careful that you don't have too much strobe light. So if you're shooting like this, you don't need much uh, strobe power. Here's another example of a 105 at 6.3, where you can see the forms really blend into like a creamy blur, which is really quite a nice effect. Yeah? Here's one from Jeff Joe, who uh, was diving with in Lembe, which I thought did a really good job in making this, uh, this uh, sep slugging slug look like he created like a sludge uh, in of color behind, which I think is a really arty way of dealing with it. Or Andrew Marriott here did this photo where you can see the apertures in the back are really, really nice, creating really, really nice sort of soft detail and almost like a stage for this ghost pipe fish which, as you know, if you've ever taken pictures of ghost pipefish, they're kind of hard to make them stand out against the background. Andrew did a beautiful job here. Yeah. So for super wide, make sure you're not fooled by the screen. Yeah, um, Make sure you zoom in on the details, make sure that picture is good because the uh, review screen might not give you an accurate uh, representation of what the picture will look like. Take many, many photos, try different apertures because sometimes you might think on your little screen that you know 7.1 is good, but later you'll find out that was too much. So make sure you shoot at least, you know, sort of three, four aperture steps up and down of what you were trying to practice with because essentially you'll regret it if you only shoot one aperture. And try to also focus on different details. Focus on the eyes, focus on the mouth, focus on whatever, something else. And make sure that that is sharp when you zoom in on your review picture. Right? Also, another tip for uh, macro photography is uh, every evening you have to check all your photos. Because sometimes you will just keep shooting at a rate, and this still happens to me all the time, where you're just shooting at f13 or something, and you think that's fine for this lens camera combination, but it isn't. And you keep shooting the whole week, and then you realize all of your pictures don't have enough focus. So make sure that you check your photos on the computer every day of the dive week. I personally always say when people ask me, oh, did you get a good photo? I always just say, I'll let you know after I've seen it on the computer because only then do you know if it is a good photo. So let's talk about the next category in this section, which is disco bokeh. Yeah, so here's a big inspiration for me from Tobias Friedrich, uh, who did a great talk with us, um, uh, which is also on, uh, on the Insider Academy. And uh, you can see here that he's using special details in the background to create a really funky, what I like to call disco pokey. Um, so in disco bokeh, we basically are trying to create a specialized effect 
in the background that's artificial. So not created by nature, so you need to know if you want to do that. But essentially, you can create extremely interesting details. Now, I'm going to tell you right away, you're not going to create pictures like this because Tobias is using a very special lens called Trio Plan, which is an investment. It's a, it's a, basically a, a relic from another time. It doesn't have autofocus, so you have to set your focus above water, and it's kind of complicated to use, and it will cost you at least 500, 600 US dollars secondhand. No more new lenses available, but we can still try to do something similar with the use of other lenses. So here's uh, one of these uh, lenses. This is Senet, but there's also Trio Plan on the left. And these lenses create these sort of what they call bubble bokeh. And bubble bokeh is a very, very nice effect, but you can only use it sometimes. And like I said, these lenses, you cannot adjust underwater. Yeah? Um, so here we're compounding the aperture effect, making it extremely extreme. Yeah? Um, and so when a lot of light passes, it also reflects. So any light that reflects on anything will create a blur. And that is what we're going for here. Right? So if you try it on your Christmas tree with these lenses, you can create these bubbles very, very quickly. But even if you're using a normal camera, so here's a 60 millimeter on a D850 or D500, I'm not quite sure what I used here. And you can see in the background, we have these circular uh, uh, reflections. So we actually use reflective backgrounds that we position behind the animals. So you have a little clip slate where we put um, reflective materials on there that you can get in uh, textile markets or um, costume shops or something like that. And you just position them behind, shine a torch at them and create this lighting effect. And this here, for example, is uh, actually a ornament, like uh, I bought that in a, a clothing textile shop where uh, these are actually rose petals that I just laid around behind the seahorse and they create actually a very nice uh, bubble bokeh effect. Here's my buddy Dan Pinto, did a really nice effect with uh, a similar blue background that I used but using a, a sort of darker setting so that only a sum of those actually reflect out, creating a very very nice effect um, with this skeleton shrimp here in Anilao. So um, if you're doing that, make sure you do test shots of the background. Yeah. So you put the background there. Make sure you light that background with a separate torch. Generally, that torch needs to be quite far away. You only want these reflective materials to have a hint of light on there so that they sparkle a little bit, but not too much. Because if it's too bright, you will overexpose, won't look good anymore. So you need to play with that. And I would suggest to do a couple of test shots when there's no animal. Make sure you kind of got your camera setting, strobe setting, lights, torch setting, and this background set before you start putting it behind other people. Yeah? So um, that's worth exploring. So if you're shooting uh, bokeh, you need to shoot with a wide aperture. So you need to do something where you can get your uh, subject relatively sharp. Um, and preferably the subject is flat, like in a two-dimensional way from the side, so that there's not that much depth of field on there. Because if you do the animal in depth of field and the background is in the bokeh, it all gets a bit too blurry. So generally it's better if you can get the subject to be really sharp and crisp and then the background is what's bokeh. Yeah? Um, also vary on the lighting angle with your torch so that it sparkles in a different way. You can also use two torches or colored torches and it will all help you light up this background. Yeah? Here's another one from our last workshop where Matt Nathaway made a really nice effect with this multicolor background that I could never really use for anything. And he made it work with this uh, baby uh, trigger fish, uh, baby uh, file fish. Um, it did a really great job and uh, result with that. So now we used uh, aperture. Now let's use shutter speed. Shutter speed is in macro much less common. We actually use it more in wide angle, right? To, either freeze motion or blur motion, uh, but we can use it in macro as well. Again, we've got a secondary effect, as I explained in section two. Essentially, if you're doing a slow shutter speed, now you've got the same hole, but you're opening it for a longer time. So if you're opening the hole for one second, or you're opening it for half a second, you will see that much less light will travel through. So therefore, it will also have less motion capture. So if you're doing a quick one like this, the animal passes by, but you're only freezing it at 1 250s of a second. So the animal wouldn't have moved in a 250s of a second. But if you're shooting it at a second, the animal will have moved. And there you get the motion blur, which is a nice effect in wide angle. But do we want it in macro? That effect is explained with what the flash actually does. Right? So here's another nice um, uh, um, set up from um, Corticella Photography that shows you that the shutter speed 
affects the background but does not affect the flash exposure. The flash overpowers the, uh, the shutter speed motion, so you can still freeze something but only where the strobe reaches. So anything that's in the background, that's what should be only shutter speed effect. The flash will not have an effect. And that's the blurry bits. Yeah? Uh, like I said, I explained this in part two. So if you want to uh, check it out um, in more detail, you can do that. Right? But if you're shooting macro, the animals are not moving much and you're not using much ambient light. So very often the shutter speed doesn't have any influence on it at all. Here, um, this is from Robin Kant, um, who's doing a, uh, a sort of, you know, a, a bubble drop picture. Now, there is no background lighting, yeah? So he's shooting this with a very slow uh, exposure time, which is one second, and the strobe light still freezes everything. Because none of the ambient light lights up, the uh, strobe light overpowers this effect. And this is what makes it so difficult to use it in macro, because there is less ambient light that we use, and so even a slow um, shutter speed will not have an effect that much. So what happens if we want to try long exposure for macro? Because that is also an effect that's very nice. This is a photo that took me forever to take. Yeah? So this is a juvenile sweet lip that does this uh, funny dance all the time. But taking a photo of this is very, very difficult, because the strobe light freezes it all. Right? So therefore, you need to come with an interesting combination of both video light and strobe light to actually be able to capture this motion. Because the strobe light freezes the animal, but when the animal is in motion, that should be covered by the video light. Right? So um, if you have the shutter speed uh, examples here, yeah, so one second you see there's a lot of motion, and one eight hundredth there's no motion at all, we're trying to capture this motion here. Yeah? So the shutter speed uh, essentially creates a motion, but if we strobe, as we just said, then it will freeze the motion in there. Yeah? So here we've got one twentieth, yeah? but this is at night, so that's a bit easier. But essentially you can get a part of the wiggle uh, covered in the, uh, with the light of the um, focus light. Okay. Here we've got ambient light that overpowers strongly, and here I'm doing a bit of a pull with the camera, but essentially what you can see is that there's ambient light coming in from the top, and that essentially is creating much more blur than when we do it on black background. On black background, it's literally just the motion of the animal, um, and here we've got the blur of uh, the movement and the ambient light, right? So it's very important to decide what flash burst you do because essentially the camera is usually set to have a first curtain picture. First curtain means that it will fire the strobe and the, the camera will stay more longer open and will capture the motion in that outside space. So you need to decide if you want to have the um, uh, flash at the beginning or at the end. Yeah? So if you want to have a trail, yeah, that means actually that you want to have the flash at the end because the animal is moving, you get the motion, and then you sharpen the front. So you need to shoot in Canon, they call it second curtain, which is an expression I like, but in uh, Nikon, for example, they call it rear flash. Um, but essentially, it's actually front flash because what happens is if you've got the motion with a rear flash, it means it flashes afterwards, but it will flash to freeze the motion um, at the end of the picture, which means the motion is there first, and then you freeze. Because if you don't do that, you will have the, the face in the beginning, and then a blur after that. So all of these pictures that I'm showing you here are shot with rear sync. Yeah? Rear sync, uh, flash, or second curtain. And you can see there is a bit motion of the animal in there. All right, so here's one from Tobias Friedrich, where you can see with the video lights, he's done a very, very long blur, and then the strobe light. Um, you can enhance this effect by moving the camera. You can see on the blurry background here that I'm moving the camera, and that creates an additional blur that might be an interesting effect that you might want to go for. This is a picture I took in Anilao last year um, that was inspired by a picture I saw from uh, Alex Mustard, and you can see that the, uh, the frogfish is sharp, and I'm dragging the camera away from the frogfish, but because it's a snoot, the only the background actually gets unsharp and the animal itself stays very crisp and so it looks like this sort of old man in a busy street scene in Tokyo at least that's what I see in it. So how to shoot long exposure start with 120 and then 
go sort of up and down a little bit practicing. Um, steady the camera as much as possible, but if you want to go motion blur, then you can of course also move the camera. Um, if you have more video light, it is better because that is what captures the blur. Right? So that is really important. And then set it to slow sync, rear sync, or second curtain. And you're going to have to power the strobes pretty strong because they need to freeze the motion. Right? So you need to do that quite extreme. Also, you need to shoot at a very, very small aperture because now there's a lot of light coming in because the shutter speed is really long and you've got strobe light coming in. So you need to shoot at a very small aperture. So here is uh, another example for the uh, front curtain and rear curtain. This is from uh, shoot phase one. Um, you can see if you shoot with a front curtain, you can see that you get the ball in the beginning, but then the trail is afterwards, which doesn't really make sense. It actually looks like the ball is coming back at you. So therefore rear curtain, I know it's confusing, but rear curtain means that the, the flash exposes first and then uh, crisps everything up with the final picture and that creates this light streak that is much better to look at. Yeah? So make sure that you've got that set, the flash should be at the end of your picture and then you can create this nice trailing effect. Here's also a very nice example with pictures, you've maybe seen sort of these long exposure pictures uh, of street scenes and, 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 and in cities. Well if you have them, uh, if you're trying to light something up then you need to use rear sync because otherwise you will see the car is behind and it kind of looks like the the, the train car in this case with front uh, um, uh, sync is actually looks like it's going backwards. Right? So that's why make sure you always have it ring. Here in this picture from uh, Marie Charlotte from her um, uh, workshop a few years ago, you can see here she is using the front sync because the stripes are going forward into the picture. Right, So it's sharpens the picture the the fish and then the strobe uh, the um, motion goes forward but it's actually a quite nice effect because these lines are so interesting so that's why I kind of like to show it you can also use that sometimes if that's an effect you want to go for all right here's Richard Barton that was the picture I was trying to emulate his is much better than mine but essentially what do we see here is it front or is it rear well I'll answer the question for you it's of course rear flash okay. so for that, guys, um, make sure you play with different speeds until you find the right way. I always use my hand, still hand, using your fingers a little bit, using your fingers more. That's how you can practice trying to get a nice black background and a little bit of motion blur before you try yourself on the subject. Steady the camera unless you're doing a movement. Make sure you set the strobe to slow sync. Have different powers of strobes, but mostly you want to go for a strong power and have the video at, uh, at full light so that you can create this blur. Yeah. So that was kind of what I wanted to talk about today, um, which is sort of advanced macro or macro part two. We talked about wide apertures, including black backgrounds. We talked about diopters. We talked about creative ways of doing bokeh, including disco bokeh. Um, and, um, and we also talked about slow shutter and how you can create effects with that. So um, any questions, you can pop them down in below. Um, I also wanted to mention that I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, I am uh, I'm able to coach you uh, on a distance. Um, we can work together via Zoom. I can look at your screen. I can help you with the editing of your pictures. I can help you with portfolio discussions. We can work on competitions. We can uh, work on anything that you want work with. I've worked with people on their setups. All of that is possible. I, 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 fix, I have a fixed rate for that, but we can just uh, do it as you need. So contact me if you want to do any of that. Um, check out my website. I've now uh, got a store as well. So if you're interested, you can have a look at all my photographs. And if you like, you can purchase a, a print or a shirt or, or a cup or something. Um, also, uh, check out all the Insider uh, Divers links, uh, particularly this YouTube channel. If you're not a subscriber yet, make sure you subscribe to this channel and check out all the other cool videos. And finally, we have a community on Facebook that is really, really active, um, that is all about sharing knowledge. So uh, you might want to join that. So just look for Insider Divers community, a really cool uh, community that's growing and has lots of cool, cool input. So thank you very much for listening in and your interest. Put your questions here below. Make sure you subscribe and I hope you all stay well and see you soon on a dive trip. Bye.